Open your Bibles with me, please, to 1 John, 1 John chapter 1. The term gospel means good news, and the good news in the New Testament is that Jesus came and died and was buried and rose again to pay for our sins. That's the good news. But the gospel, the good news, also is the story of Jesus' life. And so Mark begins his story of Jesus' life with the phrase, the gospel of Jesus Christ. So we refer to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John as gospels. About the last half of the New Testament is a bunch of letters. They are letters. There's an old English word that just means letter that we have come to use almost exclusively for these letters in the Bible. That word is epistle. It just means letter. But we mostly use it anymore just uh, in, uh, in context of church in the Bible. So at the end of your Bible, right before Jude and Revelation, are three little letters. The one we're going to look at first has five chapters, and the other two just one chapter apiece. Three letters, three epistles written by the Apostle John. We know they were written by the Apostle John, even though this first one does not mention his name. It's his style in the Gospel of John. He doesn't mention his name either. But um, if you compare it to the Gospel of John, and we'll do a little bit of that comparison even today, it's very clear the same person wrote them. And the early church writers, I think of Irenaeus and Polycarp and a couple of others, wrote that John wrote this while he was the pastor at Ephesus. The next background question is when? And we don't know. It doesn't say specifically, but the general impression we have and the general consensus of the Bible scholars is that it was written late. Was it written before or after the Gospel of John? That's an interesting question. My personal guess is after, but I can't point you to a specific verse or anything like that that would suggest that. So those are background issues to the epistle that we call 1 John. And I'll mention just a couple of more uh, background things, but actually I'm going to do a lot of overview, not background, but overview, there's a difference, before we actually dive into the first paragraph of the book. In our prayer time before, during the worship time, we spent some time praying for America, praying specifically because of the events that happened yesterday. If you're watching this uh, sermon later on and all you're seeing is the sermon, today, uh, well, today is the day after the assassination attempt on former President Trump. In my pulpit prayer today, it occurred to me while we were singing the last song that there were other people that none of us that prayed about yesterday prayed for. Join me in praying for the other victims yesterday. Our Father God, we worship you, we acknowledge that you are sovereign, and we thank you for sparing our country the assassination of a major presidential candidate. But Lord, we pray for the other victims. There was a murder yesterday, not just an attempted murder. A man took one of the bullets that was intended for Mr. Trump and is dead, we pray for his family. We pray that someone who knows you would reach out to them with the comfort that is found in Jesus Christ and you would draw them to yourself. We pray for the two people who were injured, two men who apparently were fairly seriously injured. Lord, we pray for that you would heal them, that you would draw them to yourself, bless their families. And Lord, we pray for the families of the assassin. How awful it would be to have your 20-year-old son or brother or relative be the person that showed up on the news yesterday. Lord, I pray that you would help them to deal with the situation. And Lord, I pray that you would draw them to yourself, that through someone who knows you, you would extend your comfort. And Lord, we thank you for the joy and fellowship that is ours as believers. And we thank you for this wonderful book that has so many teachings about how we can know you better, about you, and about us. 
I pray that in these coming weeks as we study the book of 1 John that we would be drawn closer to you and closer in fellowship to one another. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. As we begin this book, I'm going to have you do something a little bit different. Let's start with the reverse side of your sermon notes. And let's look at the overview of the book. I uh, dipped into the book and pulled a lot of interesting things out of it just to show you. And that's a representative sample under all those categories. That's just what would fit in the page. And we're going to go through that briefly before we look at the first paragraph of the book. This, my Bible says, the first letter of John. Some Bibles say epistle, the old English word. It is a letter. But wait a minute. Most of the epistles in the New Testament start out by naming the author and the addressee and with a greeting and they close. Even the next two, Second John begins the elder, Third John begins the elder. They both close with a verse that says, I got a lot more I want to tell you, but I'll, I'll, I'll wait to see you, and so on. This book doesn't have any of that. Is it a letter? Well, yes, it is a letter. It's definitely a letter. Look at chapter 2, verse 1. I hope you're open to chapter 1. You can probably see chapter 2. Chapter 2, verse 1. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. What do we call a document that we're writing to send to somebody else? An email. <laughs> That's what we call it nowadays. No, this is, this is a letter. This is definitely a letter. It's a letter. Well, it's not addressed to anybody. Well, yes, it is. Jump ahead to chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5, verse 13. A wonderful, wonderful verse. If you don't know this verse and don't have it marked in your Bible, if you're a Bible marker, by the way, I'm not, for what it's worth. But if you're a Bible marker, mark it in your Bible. 1 John 5, 13. These things I have written to you, believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. Let's look at the first half of that verse first. These things I have written to whom? To you who believe in the name of the Son of God. There is a perspective out there. There is a notion out there that the letters that Paul wrote to the, 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 the churches, the, the Pauline epistles in particular, are the ones that address the church age specifically. And they're the only ones we should look at. But think about it. The first letter to the Corinthians, the second letter to the Corinthians, the letter to the Romans, those were written, well, we'll, we'll focus in on Corinthians. The letters to the Corinthians were written to the church at Corinth. Are we the church at Corinth? Praise God for the church of Corinth. They were a really messed up church. So we have two books in the Bible that tell us how to deal with church messes. And we've had our share of messes. But we're not the church of Corinth, are we? The letter to Titus was written to Titus. Are you Titus? Is Titus back there? Titus is in the, in the children's church. <laughs> um, the letter to Philemon was written to Philemon. Are you Philemon. In a real sense, and this is true, by the way, of all these so-called general epistles, the ones that don't have labels. It's, you know, this applies equally to James or to, to, to Hebrews. But the general epistles, in a sense, are more ours. They're written to everybody. They're written to us. They're written to us who believe. By the way, if you are here and you don't know Jesus, you don't have a relationship with Jesus, this book, 1 John, has a remarkable amount of information about who Jesus is crammed into these five short chapters. Read it. It's a whole lot shorter than the Gospel of John. Get to know Jesus. But the book is written to us who believe in the name of the Son of God. The book, in a very real sense, is written to us. Read it as a letter to you. Well, I still have that verse up there. Let's, let's sort of introduce the next category. 
Let's say it's toward the end of your work day and um, the boss says, I want to see you in my office uh, first thing tomorrow morning. That's all he says. What are you going to be wondering overnight? Am I going to get a raise? Am I going to get a promotion? Am I going to get a criticism? Am I going to get a warning? Am I going to get a pink slip? There's probably more possibilities than that. What's it about? What's it all about? John tells us several purposes of his book, and this is actually the last one, but it's one of the best ones. While I still have it up here, let's look at it. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may, what is that next word? Know that you have eternal life. My friends, as believers in Jesus, the Son of God, we can know that we're saved. Don't take my word for it. Don't take any preacher's word for it. Look at the verse for yourself. Read it off the page in front of you, ideally, not just off my projection screen. You can know that you have eternal life. That's one of the reasons John wrote the book. That's one of the things we can learn from the book. Learn that thing as we study the book. By the way, at the end of last month, I... Uh, Following the lead of the governor of Tennessee, of all people, I challenge you all to pray and fast for America during the month of July. How's that going? I have another challenge for you. First John's a short little book, and we are going to take our time working through it. I challenge you, and take me up on it. Let me know if you take me up on it. Memorize the book of First John these next few months while we're working through it. Can you handle it? I dare you. And yes, you can handle it. Back to the verse, back to the purpose. These things were written so that you may know that you have eternal life. And that just sort of introduces the category. What are the purposes of the book? The, first, the second verse says the purpose of the book is to proclaim eternal life to us. Okay, we'll talk about that a little bit more when we get to that first paragraph. We haven't even started yet. This is still overview. Another purpose for the book in chapter, uh, chapter 1, verse 4, is to give us fullness of joy. I already read, for as a different proof text, chapter 2, verse 1. These things I've written to you so that you may not sin. I look at every one of you. I look at the ones I know well. I look at the ones I know not so well. None of you have any sin problems, right? I don't either. Uh, I better take that back or lightning might flash. <laughs> These things I have written to you so that you may not sin. I'm not dropping the message to discuss current events, but um, when something tragic happens in the world, when a major sin happens in the world, when there's a shooting spree or a massacre, it's shocking. But if you have a biblical view, it's not surprising. When something wonderful, when something good, when a remarkable act of altruism or heroism happens, it's delightful. But if you have a biblical worldview, it's not surprising. People are made in the image of God and have the capacity for remarkably good things. But people are also fallen and descendants of Adam and Eve and have the capacity for evil. And it's not surprising when <laughs> evil makes the headlines because we need a Savior. These things I've written to you so that you may not sin. 
And we will talk about that passage and address those issues and talk about sin, salvation, and forgiveness in depth next time we're in 1 John together. These things are written to warn us against false teachers. We'll actually talk about that a little bit more this morning. These things are written so we can know we're saved. And I'm going to come back to that one more time in a little bit because it's really important. We can know we're saved. What does the book tell us about Jesus? A whole lot. And I've got a long list there on your page. And like I said, I shortened the list of what would fit on your page. He always existed as God. That's an opening verse. We'll talk about that. He was a tangible, real, physical person. We'll talk about that some more, hopefully, this morning. He is our lawyer, chapter 2, verse 1. Why do we need a lawyer? Because we've sinned against God. We're being judged. Jesus is our lawyer. He's our sin payment. That's verse 2. He promised us eternal life. That's chapter 2, 25. He's coming again. The last part of chapter 2 and the first part of chapter 3 are about Jesus is coming back. Yes, here in this short little book that has so much else, it's also got what we call eschatological teachings, end times teachings. He's coming back. What else does the book tell us about Jesus? He came to destroy the works of the devil. And this book states very, very clearly that Jesus is the Messiah, that he's the Son of God, and that he is the true God. Look at the next to last verse in the book. The next to last verse in 1 John. That's the easy way to remember it. The reference is 1 John 5.20. I put it up there. We know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. According to that verse, don't take my word for it, according to that verse, on your page, on the screen, on your computer, on your phone, according to that verse, who is the true God and eternal life? The Son, Jesus Christ. Is that what it says? Don't let, me, don't let me lead you. See it for yourself. This verse is interesting in sort of a backwards and peculiar kind of way. Besides a straightforward truth. There's a slew of verses in the New Testament that state clearly that Jesus is God. And another 50 that uh, teach that Jesus is God without saying it in quite so many words. There is a religious outfit in town. They don't even call themselves a church, so why, well, why would I? That denies that Jesus is God. The Jehovah's Witnesses. You notice their building isn't a church building, it's the kingdom hall. The Jehovah's Witnesses deny that Jesus is God. How can they do that when there's verses all through the New Testament that say so? They've changed their New Testament. Their Bible, the so-called New World Translation of the Scriptures, changes the verses that says Jesus is God to read something different. Except this one. They forgot to change this one. This one works even in their Bible. I looked it up online again this past week. It says what it says even in the New World Translation of the Holy Scriptures. Jesus is the true God and eternal life. The next to last verse in 1 John. That's the easy way to remember that. Remember it if ever you are encountering or discussing Jesus' deity with someone who has been drawn in by the Jehovah's Witness cult. And pray for them. They need to get to know Jesus. What are the book's teachings about God? Those are easy to summarize. God is life. God is light. And God is love. Those are the book's teachings about God. Well, we talked about the book's purposes. We talked about the teachings about Jesus, the teachings about God. This book has a whole lot to say about us and how you and I tick. 
and how temptation works in our lives and how salvation works in our lives. And I've got, again, just a representative sample on here. What we're going to look at in just a minute in the first paragraph is that we can have fellowship. The next time we're in 1 John together, we'll talk about we can be forgiven and cleansed. Isaiah 118 says, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. We can be forgiven and cleansed. And 1 John, John is an author, but 1 John is a book, is a very black and white book. You're either in or you're out. You're either walking in the light or you're in darkness. You're either saved or you ain't. The book says over and over again, and this isn't all the references by any means, you need to live out what you believe. If you're not walking it, you're in darkness, he says. If you hate your brother, you can't love Jesus, he says. And on and on and on. All these black and white statements about either you're in or you're out. And if you're not living it, you're not in it. If you're not living like a Christian, your Christianity isn't real. Over and over again. We need to live out what we believe and as we go through the book, we'll major on those because obviously it's a major point in the book. What else? The book says that we are children of God and we will be like Jesus. The opening verses of chapter 3, one of my favorite passages in the Bible. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet appeared what we shall be, but we know when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him just as he is. Amen, hallelujah, and praise God for that. And we can know that we have eternal life. Before we get to that first paragraph in the book, one more thing. I love that first one on that screen, 1 John 3, 1 through 3. But let's drop it out for just a moment and look at the one before it and the one after it together. These are not contradictory ideas. These are the two sides of the same equation, the two lines on your lane that you need to stay between. On the one hand, you need to live out what you believe. And if you're not living it, you're not saved. That's what the book says. You don't believe me? Go home and read this afternoon. By the way, there's a challenge for you. Read First John at a sitting this afternoon. It's five short chapters. You can do that. Football season hasn't started yet. You've got all afternoon. And I hope the Bible trumps football season for you. You have to live what you believe. And if you're not living it, you're not in it. That's the teaching of the book. But it also teaches that you can know you're saved. Those are not contradictory ideas. The Apostle Paul says the same thing in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 19. He says, the Lord knows those who are his. It's sure. And let every man who names the name of Christ depart from unrighteousness. You can know it's definite, and you need to live it. That first statement does not make the second statement iffy. They work together in our lives. And that's something we'll address repeatedly as we go through the book. Now, would you read with me? All that was overview. Not really introduction, just overview. Would you read with me, please, John chapter 1, and we'll glance briefly at the first four verses. 1 John chapter 1, the epistle of John, the first letter of John chapter 1. What was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we've looked at and touched with our hands, concerning the word of life. And the life was manifested, and we have seen and testify and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. 
What we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you also, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. These things we write so that our joy may be made complete. Verse 5, this is the message we have heard from him and announced to you that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus his son cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. I showed you 1 John 5, 20, the next to last verse in the book. The very first verse in the book says, what was from the beginning... It's a tie-in to the Gospel of John. That's how he begins the Gospel of John, very similarly. It's a link back to the book of Genesis, chapter 1, verse 1, the beginning. At the beginning and end of 1 John, the emphasis is Jesus is God. Here he's always been. Jesus was there before the beginning. Jesus instituted the beginning. He created. Jesus has already been. He's God. End of the book. We are in him who is true in his son, Christ Jesus. This is the true God and eternal life. But the very next point here, after talking about John being eyewitness, is that Jesus is a man. Look again at the words there at the beginning of verse 1. What was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. In our culture, the theater anymore mostly means the movie theater. But let's talk about the theater. How many of you know what the word, what a thespian is? That's more than half the crowd. The word theater and the word thespian have the same root word. A thespian, by the way, is an actor or an actress in the theater. Thespian and theater. Those two words have the same root word, and the root word is the verb form. The second one here, he says, we saw and we looked at Jesus. That's the word from which we get theater and thespian. When you go to a theater, do you just look at it, or do you, you sit and look at it over a period of time, right? If you watch on TV, you see the commercials, but you watch the program. John emphasizes we didn't just see Jesus, we watched him over a period of time. John lived with this guy, walked with this guy, listened to this guy, touched this guy, ate with this guy, camped out with this guy for three, three and a half years. And he was the word of life. He was the word of life. Why does it emphasize that we handled him and touched him? Still there in verse 1. It's interesting, the first lie, the first heresy about Christ that invaded the early church was not denial of him being God. It was denial of him being really, fully a human. He just seemed like a human. That's what John's focusing on here. After the opening statement that Jesus always was, focusing in on Jesus was real. The worldly notions, the worldly philosophies of their day had invaded the church. We're not at risk at that, are we? The worldview out there doesn't affect ours at all, right? We're not shaped by it. No, never. Um, And obviously, I'm kidding. We need to be very careful to weed out the ways that the world wants to press us into its mold. But their worldview, one of the major philosophies out there was that matter 
was evil, including our bodies were evil. And there were actually two different reactions to that. One group of people says, since your bodies are evil, you need to really put it down and be hard on yourselves. And the other says, since our bodies are evil and reality is something super, supernatural, our bodies don't really matter. You can do whatever you want. You know, we take the, take the same notion and twist it in different directions. But since matter was viewed as evil, they didn't think Jesus could be really material. And what's John saying? I touched this guy. He washed my feet. I washed his. We lived together. You know, at the Last Supper, they're laying on couches and John's lying up against Jesus. In the youth group, we're going through Genesis, and it's interesting to observe the young people's reactions to different things. When, uh, when, when Jacob first met his cousin and later his wife, Rachel, what did he do? He kissed her and fell on her neck and wept. Try that on for size. And uh, all these other times when they fell on their neck and wept, the young people go, ooh, that's weird. They were a more touchy culture than we are. I don't know what your family culture is, but they were, they were a close and touchy culture. John says... We handled them. Jesus was really human as well as being really God. He identified with us so that we can get saved. He was a real, tangible, fully human. In chapter 4, it says those who deny that he came in the flesh, in meat, in a body, those who deny it are false teachers. He was a real, tangible, fully human being, and he is the word of life. In the Gospel of John, John begins, In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Here, John is emphasizing that he's the word of life. Jesus is the source of life. He's the way, the truth, and the life. Looking on down the passage, verse 2. And the life was manifested, we have seen and testified and proclaimed to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. Again, an echo from the first chapter of the Gospel of John. Jesus came to reveal God to us. Jesus manifested God to us. What does that mean to you and me? If you want to know what God is like, look at Jesus. Everything that Jesus is and was communicates to us who God is. Jesus is the manifestation of God. Jesus is is God's word, God's logos, God communicating himself and his essence to us. And John and the other eyewitness testified to the truth of that. That's the end of verse 2. If someone asks you, how do you know Jesus is real, what would you say? One way to respond to this is ask them, how do they know Abraham Lincoln was real? The first Republican president to be assassinated the first Republican president. How do you know Abraham Lincoln was real? From eyewitness testimony written down in history. That's how we know Jesus was real. Because the eyewitnesses that wrote down their testimony, a whole bunch of them, and John's emphasizing that he was one of them. By this point, very possibly, he was the last one. And what is the message here? Verse 3, what we have seen and heard we proclaim to you also, that you also may have fellowship with us, and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. The wonderful truth of the gospel, the wonderful truth of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation is that God wants to have a relationship with you. God wants to have fellowship with you.
And notice, we have fellowship with the Father, with the Son, and who else? With each other, with one another. Susie shared a testimony this morning that fits right into this. She met some random strangers in the breakfast area of a hotel, and lo and behold, they were believers, and there was a fellowship that's there. The word fellowship is koinonia. The root word of koinonia it means, it has the idea of sharing something in common. You have something in common with the other person. We have Christianity in common with other people, sometimes other people that we have nothing else in common with. Fellowship with God, fellowship with one another is how God intended it and what Christianity is all about. Let me talk for a moment to the people, specifically to the people watching this on the live stream. If you can't be here today, I'm going to name names. Ida, Carol, we love you. We miss you. We're sorry you can't be there. We're glad we can provide this to you by the Internet. But being watching a church service is not the same as fellowship. Be here. And if you're out of state and you like these sermons, great. We're happy to provide them for you. But be in fellowship with a local church somewhere where you are. Fellowship. Jesus came and died in order to restore fellowship, not only between us and God, but between us and one another. We can have fellowship, and I've already gone ahead with this. We can have fellowship with the Father, the Son, and with other believers. Verse 4, these things we write so that your joy may be complete. My friends, we share each other's sorrows. We should also share each other's joys, and we should rejoice in Christ. He is the source of joy. And fellowship with Jesus and fellowship with other believers is how we have joy. In closing, I'm going to go back again to chapter 5, verse 13. You can know that you have eternal life. Do you know that you have eternal life? If not, don't leave here today without asking somebody how to get to know Jesus. And the overall emphasis in the book is we have to live out what we believe. Are you living in fellowship with Jesus? Are you living in fellowship with other believers? Are you walking in the light If not, your salvation, your religion isn't doing you any good now. And according to the black and white statements in 1 John, it won't do you any good in the future either, forever. If you are away from God, out of fellowship with God, remember the story of the prodigal son. He didn't lose his relationship with his dad. His dad was still the father. He was out of fellowship he was far away. He needed to come back to God's loving arms and receive God's forgiveness. If you're away from God, it isn't because he ran away from you. We run away from him. Return to fellowship with him. Let's pray. Our Father God, we thank you for the price Jesus paid to enable us to have fellowship with him, with you, with one another and with fellow believers. Lord, I thank you for the joy that Jesus brings and for the assurance that we can know 
that we have eternal life. And Lord, I pray that each one of us would respond to the challenge to live out what we say we believe. To have nothing to do with the unfruitful deeds of darkness. To walk in the light, to walk in fellowship with you, to confess our sins and be cleansed. To purify ourselves. I thank you for this book, 1 John, on those challenges and others. And I pray that you would revive, revitalize, restore each one of us over the coming months as we study through it, that we would draw closer to you today from these challenges in the overview and the opening paragraph. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Today's benediction is from Psalm 119. May we be continually in God's word that we may enjoy his blessing and may know him. Amen. Go with God.